Everyone, I'd like to welcome you here this morning to the meeting of the Minnehaha County Commission. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to remind everyone to silence their cell phones. Um, meeting documents are available for review <coughs> somewhere. I don't see them right now. Um, but they'll be available for review down at the end at some point. And uh, Craig and Carol are here if you need a listening device. That takes us to routine business. I'd consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next item is to approve the um, commission meeting minutes from April 16th, 2019. Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item is bills to be paid in the amount of $2,462,693.77. Madam Chair, play, uh, let's pay the bills. Okay. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any comments? Uh, I, I'd just like to remark on a couple of the bills. One is that uh, two million of this, two million and fifteen thousand uh, dollars, is part of our ongoing construction uh, projects, and so that's the, the majority of this. And also, I'd point out that we had a number of bills for four hundred and twenty dollars for uh, paying uh, electric bills for folks in uh, who are facing shutoff. It's something that we take. Uh, uh, help try to take care of uh, $420 in a year is the most we'll do for any single person and uh, Carrie was telling me Carrie Benz who's here uh, that we uh, they oftentimes have bills of a couple of thousand and so we're not paying the whole bill but we're trying to prevent them from being uh, shut off and uh, we also had a couple of funerals for $5,000 total and uh, I think those are People don't always appreciate all the all the things that the county is involved in, and uh, these are just some. Any other comments? I appreciate those comments. I know every, I mean still, every week when I go through our bills that I learn things about county operations and, and the important work that we're doing um, day in and day out. And so I appreciate, I appreciate you bringing attention to those. I have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor of paying the bills? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item are reports. There's uh, several reports there that I would uh, recommend that you all uh, look at. For those in the public, we have um, the Minnehaha County Abandoned Cemetery Board Minutes for October 2018, the Minnehaha County Weed and Pest Board Minutes for April 2019, <coughs> uh, the Juvenile Detention Center Report for March 2019, and the Human Services uh, First Quarter Report for Minnehaha and Lincoln County. Um, all reminders of the important and very diverse work that goes on here at the county. Uh, next item is personnel actions. I'd consider a motion to approve the routine personnel actions. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next item, item are abatements. Um, first we'll do the abatements recommended for approval. Olivia. Yes, we have two sections. So the first is item A, Kingdom Boundaries Prison Aftercare Ministries, Inc., parcel 34105, 2017 property tax exemption in the amount of $3,840.27. I'll make a motion to give that abatement. Sure. Second. Is there a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Karski? Yes. Barth? Banaga? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, if you want to do the assessment freezes. Yes, uh, B through F are all for the assessment freeze, 2018 property taxes. The first is parcel 12091 in the amount of $974.79. The second is parcel 30843 in the amount of $452.34. The next is parcel 40000 in the amount of $898.81. The next is parcel 46088 in the amount of $1,241.83. And the final one is 67707 in the amount of $163.06. I'd make a motion to approve those. I do have a comment. I'll, I'll second. I'll do a second. I have a question. 
Okay, so we have a motion and a second, a comment <coughs> and a question. We'll start with the comment first. Um, sometimes I think with our citizens there's a little confusion about this because I recently had an interaction with a, uh, a citizen who couldn't understand why uh, his valuation was staying the same but his taxes went up. And when we do the, the freeze, it freezes the valuation, not your taxes. And so uh, that, uh, that's what happened to him, and he couldn't understand it. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Karski? These, my understanding, are all elderly freezes, correct? Okay. And the one, you know, their comment on there that they were hospitalized and they missed the um, application deadline. There's no way to go back on that? Is there anybody that can answer that? Yeah, it's Chris, for e Lillo Equalization Office. Yeah, it, there's a provision in the law for elderly freeze, uh, also for disabled vets. It's two of the laws that, that hold in the codified law that if you would have been eligible, you met all the criteria, but you missed the deadline, that they can petition the, the Board of County Commissioners for either an abatement or a refund of property taxes. So there is a deadline, April 1, for the elderly freeze, but there really isn't a deadline. If they miss it, if, if by April 1 we can get it, get it pushed in, if they miss it, then we can go through the abatement process. So this individual could go back and ask for one for the prior year too yet at, at this point? These should be it. Um, this is the one year they miss. Generally they miss and then we oh, catch it and we do the abatement. And if we miss, then we catch it and do the abatement. But otherwise, I believe it's three years we can go back. Okay. Okay. Maggie might be able to answer more to that. Uh, on, on the elderly freeze, I believe it's three years. So if they missed it for four four years, hopefully we would have caught it at, at that point in time. But okay. um, I believe the law is three, unless there's uh, other provisions out there. But thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I think I still need a motion. Move for approval. Okay. That we had one. Uh, maybe we did. Motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Far. Benega? Aye. Karski? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And that takes us to the next item, which is abatements recommended for denial. Yes, there are two recommended for denial. Um, they are both for Trent and Tammy <coughs> Baumgartel for parcel 85978. The first is 2017 property taxes in the amount of $1,060.82, and the second is 2018 property taxes in the amount of $1,101.38. I have a question, if I may. Now, Chris, would you um, outline what the requirements are for you to be able to approve this abatement? You had to recommend denial. What would it take for you to recommend approval of this? Yeah, on this one here, the reason I've recommended denial of this is because an application was not made. We need an application. Anytime there's a new house, um, there isn't any previous history of being owner-occupied. It's kind of a threefold part. If I bought a house from you and you were previously owner-occupied, when that transfer occurs on that PT-56 form, that real estate certificate of value, it comes over and asks, is the property currently owner-occupied, yes or no? Yes. Um, will you occupy that property, yes or no, by November 1? Um, is it going to be your principal place of residence? If yes, then that owner-occupied, it doesn't require an application. That continues and it moves forward. Um, if it's a new construction or a property that was not previously owner-occupied, the only way to start owner-occupied classification is by application. Um, this particular property, the owners owned the land. There was no house to be owner-occupied. A, ho a house was built on it. It's brand new. There's no previous to carry forward. So in that instance, we require a application. It's in the codified laws. Um, they have to own it by November 1st. They have to occupy it by November 1st. It has to be the principal place of resi residence, and they can only claim one property um, for owner occupancy. This one was not made. We, our office in January, so November 1, they have to own, occupy, principal residence. They actually have until March 15th of that following year to make application for that year. The reason the March 15th is by law, I have to give out their assessment notices by March 1st, they get their assessment notice, they look at it and say, oh my goodness, I'm not owner-occupied. You have two more weeks to come into our office or file application. Um, we've never received one. We actually mailed them one out in January, never received it back. 
Um, these applicants then came to me, asked, and I said, the only course of action they have to get any recourse for these two years is to go through the abatement, and I informed him that I would recommend denial as I can't give something I don't know. We don't have it. We've scoured our, our records to, to see. Um, I asked the, the applicant if he had a copy because when we get an application in, especially in office, we stamp it received and the date, we make them a copy to give back to them for their records. Did not have one. He says they dropped one off at our office. His wife did. She's really unclear what office and actually at the city. I heard her say she dropped it at City Hall. I can't say if she did or didn't, but it never made it to our office. And I can't grant something or approve something I'm unaware of. So, To follow up to that, we talked to the prior abatements that we approved. There was recourse to go back. And that's why we're doing the two years. Um, that's when the house came into existence. So the 2017 would have been the first year the house was done, then 2018. We do have him applied for 2019 taxes due and paying 20. So we're within two years. But and you can't go backwards. Had we gone back, say, we could have gone back and requested 16, 17, and 18. We would not have been able to request 15. That would have been four years then, okay. had, it, had that house existed then. So. Any other questions? Commissioner Parth. Uh Chris, uh, I think I've seen this happen before, and it often happens when people own some vacant land and build a house. Yes. Uh, you know, if you commonly have a realtor involved in this kind of stuff, we don't miss the homeowner's uh, paperwork. Yes, I would, I would agree. Um, whenever there's a realtor or abstract company involved, typically they will inform the property owner, hey, you're buying this. Make sure you go down and, and make application. Um, when we have somebody that owns a lot prior and then builds a house a year, two, three years later, there isn't that catch. Now it just simply goes into a construction loan right with the bank. There isn't a new closing. There's no deed for the house. The deed comes with the land, so there there is a there is a lapse, and we do our best. Um, and I will try to make further steps as the director here to take some further steps to try and catch those types of situations. But again, on this one, you can only lead them so far. It's the homeowner's responsibility to be educated and knowledgeable to make application. And in this instance, we actually mailed this applicant one out in January. Um, Janu I think it was January 20th, and never received it back. So. I, I don't know what more we can do. 7,000 transfers a year, 4,500 of them are potentially owner-occupied. Um, I mean, that's a lot of people to, to go out and lead for our offices. And we do the best we can, so. Any other questions? Chris, I just have one question. Yes. So you mentioned that there's this, you know, March 15th deadline to give people an opportunity. When they're looking at their um, assessment notice, what is it that they look for to make sure that, that they have owner-occupied It should status? have an S. I wish there was something different. It's an S classification. So we only have two classes of property in the state. You're either non-ag or you're ag. So when you look at your assessment cards, it will start with an NA or an AG, for starters. Anything with just letters, you know, an AGA, an AGD, an NAD, that is land. Anything that has a numerical in it, um, that means a structure, so an NAD1 would be a non-ag st structure, and if we have the S behind it, that signifies that that property is owner-occupied. I, I wish there was some other way. I wish it would spell it out. I believe this year's on our assessment notices, um, Dawn had put that on there and actually spelled out owner-occupied. Um, if it doesn't say that, then you're not. But again, you have to meet the criteria have to own it, occupy it as of November 1, principal residence, and you can only claim it on one property. So you think going forward that it is going to actually s I, spell out in English for people? Can I, I, I'm hopeful. I'm, this year it did. Um, it actually spelled it out. So I'm hopeful going forward as we transition into softwares that I can continue that. I'll try and make that. The S is very... You know, in my world, we know that's what it means. We try and educate and tell people any public forum or, or the, the meetings, we tell them this is owner-occupied, but to the, to the common homeowner, they may or may not know that. Commissioner Karski? I, I guess what I'm um, concluding is that state statute says that for the elderly, there is recourse to go Correct. back. But for the owner occupied, there is there not. is no recourse nope. for you to go back, and really for us, we can't go around state statute. Correct. 
So that's why we are where I mean, we you are. have the power, you have the authority as, as the board to approve this if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. I'm recommending you don't. <laughs> because it would um, be. It, it, would, it basically violates the codified law. Okay. Madam Chair, I'd like to respond to Commissioner Karski there. Okay, Commissioner Brown. You know, uh, one thing about the elderly freeze is that you have to do it every year. Mm -hmm. Because you might have, your finances may have changed. You do your owner occupied and it's a one time deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think oftentimes uh, with the elderly, uh, they don't remember. They're in the hospital, they're in Arizona, they're in Italy. I don't know. Um, the, uh, the point being, though, that uh, it is a little bit harder uh, to do it every year. And uh, uh, there is certainly a great benefit to being owner-occupied. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. With the owner-occupied, once you make application, you meet the criteria. You are until that property changes ownership or something or a classification change that causes it for review. It continues one time done. Um, you you have it until you sell. So, any other questions or comments? <coughs> I'd entertain a motion. I'd make a motion to deny the. Uh, applications there for uh, the bomb cartels. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Senega? Aye. Kyberger? Oh, sorry, not here. Karski? Aye. Barth? Aye. And Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is notices and requests. There are none. Uh, next item, planning and zoning notices. There are none. Um, Item nine, petition for compromise of lien. There are none, so that brings us to the opportunity for public comment. I believe there are some people here who'd like to speak on an item that is not otherwise on the agenda, and I'd welcome them to come forward. If you just identify yourself, give your name and address, that'd be great. I'm Pam Taylor Jansen. I live at 5000 South Sunnymead Circle in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I'm currently the president of the Mary Jo Wagner Arboretum. I know that you had an agenda at your last meeting that was pulled. Uh, they wanted it to come before the Arboretum Board first. We had a very rousing discussion last Thursday about the idea of granting three easements on county land. And in 2008, we had a joint agreement between the city, the county, and the Arboretum recognizing the land that was then called Parapazoo, that they would at one time need an emergency ingress and egress. And for that, they would give us just compensation. Well, now they want three emergency or egresses. And it's all in the county's hands right now. They want to take a, a private road up through the Perry Nature Center for one man so he can have a leisurely drive along the creek and take his construction equipment up that road and build his house. We actually, in 2017, when, they came, when he came out and asked for that easement, we told him no. In the attendance of that meeting was Scott Anderson, Don Kearney, Lori Kiso, who was the executive director at the Arboretum at that time, and myself and we offered him an alternate route. We thought it was over and finished, and now they have come back with the same route that he wants to do through the Perry Nature Center. I did my due diligence. I found a plan for that area that was done in 2002, and it talked about acquiring these three lots that are in contention right now. Uh, and also a, an easement through the homeowners, Bill of Homeowners Association and land on the other side of those three lots. Well, Mr. Torgelson from Lloyd Construction has now a contract for deed on those three lots. So he's holding us hostage to build his road. And Coin Bank now, which owns that property, has given away anything that they could negotiate with us for compensation for their ingress, egress, emergency access. What I'm telling the county <laughs> is that you guys are in the driver's seat. You own all of that land. 
so it is up to you whether you're going to vote yay or nay. And the city would like you to do it all or none, all three easements or none. And I think you have the right to divide those easements. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, the one thing I did <coughs> want to show you, and I'm sure you all take the Argus, that once an easement is granted, it's in perpetuity. And now the city who paid $27 million for the land down by the railroad has a Verizon easement that they don't know what they're gonna do with. It's 30 feet wide. So sometime you have to realize that once those easements go in, there's no going back and they can do whatever they want on those easements. So I'm asking you to consider thoughtfully when this issue comes before you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Mary Ellen Conley. I live at 25 South Riverview Heights. I'll try not to repeat what Pam has said. <coughs> um, the, um, let's see, let me find my place here. I'll say Co Coin Bank and Mr. Torkelson are using three lots <coughs> next to county property, the Prairie Nature Center, as leverage to get an easement for a driveway through the Mary Jo. Wagner Arboretum and East Sioux Falls historic site to a future home for Mr. Torkelson. On one map, this is labeled as Lloyd Private Drive. They also want an emergency access easement in order to develop another 18 plus acres between Arbor's Edge and the Arboretum. I'll pay a mention a third easement, which I'm not addressing here, just these two easements. The driveway easement is on county's Perry Nature portion of the Arboretum. The 500 feet portion of your property is just part of the driveway, the driveway actually goes much farther beyond that. In trade for Mr. Torkelson's driveway and the other emergency easement, Mr. Torkelson would donate three parcels that have, no, have historically had no economic value for development. They do have value to the city for a future bike trail. In my opinion, the si siting of the Arboretum about 10 years ago near these parcels actually creates much of the value they now have. The presence of the Arboretum also adds value to Arbor's Edge and the other 18 plus acres they want to develop. Coin Bank and Mr. Torkelson, in my opinion, are capitalizing on the very value that the Arboretum has created in those parcels. Mr. Torkelson wants an approximate 500 foot easement for his driveway, replete with five, replete, I wanna emphasize that, with 500 feet of prime Creekside frontage. It's a luxurious site teeming with possibility and he wants to turn it into a driveway. It's one of the prettiest and most valuable parts of the Arboretum, also the path of a popular hiking trail. It's on the portion of the Arboretum that is owned by the county and maintained by the city. There is a high bank on the south side of this creek and no soil tests have, done, have been done to even assure its stability. He has chosen this particular location because he wants it. He'd rather drive through the Arboretum to a future home because it is a prettier and more serene drive along a lovely creek than the supposed longer route past all those houses in Arbor's Edge. There is already access through Arbor's Edge to Mr. Torkelson's proposed building site. A simple bridge over the Little Creek or a culvert would connect him. He doesn't need to go through the Arboretum to get his future building site, he just wants it. However, the Arboretum has the only location for emergency access. This, without this emergency access, they will not be able to further develop this additional 18 plus acres between Arbor's Edge and the Arboretum. I do have a little note here that the, uh, how it's, there's, it's kind of a coincidence that Arbor's Edge is named Arbor's Edge because it's next to the Arboretum. The original request for emergency easement, well Pam already covered that part so I'm not gonna say that. So what are we missing here? The emergency access to make possible 18 plus acres of Arbor's Edge housing development, about 24 parcels, is worth many times more than what the three lots that they're donating are worth. According to 2010, and I'm sorry I haven't looked up the current assessment, that in 2010 th these three lots were assessed of an average of about $13,000. The county holds all the cards and there are other ways for the city to obtain the three parcels for a bike trail. 
Most importantly, we and you must consider our donors and Arboretum members, the same ones who frequent the hiking trail where Mr. Torkelson offers his driveway, plus enjoy all the other amenities of a, this very special nature area. We rely heavily on our donors, big time. We started with a small group, Sioux Falls Beautiful, of which I am a founding men member. Sioux Falls Beautiful was founded by our mentor, Tom Killian, I'm sure of whom all you know or knew. And Tom and, and Mary Jo Wagner was also a member. Her family pledged a million dollars to start the Arboretum part of the Sioux Falls Park system after her death. And since then, thousands of other donors and volunteers have signed on. How will our donors view giving away a prime property? Will they continue in our shared dream, dream of a Sioux Falls Park System Arboretum and nature space, or will they walk away when they see we're willing to give it away? Donors and volunteers offer their hearts and souls and checkbooks to keep our Mary Jo Wagner Arboretum going. And now some people want to put a driveway through the heart and soul of the Arboretum. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Diane Gildemaster, and I live at 4812 South Nicholas Avenue in Sioux Falls here. I am the executive director for the Arboretum, and um, I'm here. I, I do want to thank our couple board members that spoke. Um, you can see there's a lot of passion in the property out there, and I would, I would recommend, um, I've got a picture here, that um, kind of shows the, they have marked out the easements out there. Um, so I recommend that all of you, that before you take a vote, come out and, oh, there you go. Um, come out and look at the, the easement, where it's gonna be going through. And I'm not sure, did you get a document that looks like this too, for that consideration? We, had, we received a document that looks something similar to that, I can't tell exactly, yeah. um, that was in our Dropbox. Yeah, those the are the three bowl. easements. So the orange is one, the yellow another, and then the, the red one is the uh, one that is the private driveway. There we go, there's the picture up there. So um, so that, those are the things that you'll be considering. Um, I spoke with Confluence this morning. They're right now currently working on a master plan for the Arboretum, and they uh, were at the meeting last week and um, are considering some other options. Um, we're hoping to see those uh, renderings pretty quickly here. But yeah, those are the three. Um, the orange is just to kind of clean up, um, basically platting that, that road that's already being used. The yellow is that ingress, egress that the Arbor's Edge needs, and then the red is that private driveway. Um, the private driveway, you can see on the, the map there that you can see those old plats from East Sioux Falls. And so you're, you can see the red goes right through the middle of what's historic East Sioux Falls. And um, it will cut into those, you know, that along the creek where those properties were. And there's still a lot of historical artifacts down in there, plantings. Um, so so it's, a, it's a property, I think, that you need to come and see. And I'm willing to take you out there. We've got a golf cart, and I can take you out there if you need to. Um, and I will, you know, get to Scott Anderson those renderings as soon as we get something. So I would just love to have you consider coming out to see it before you vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here today for public comment that would like to speak about something that's not on the agenda? Okay. That will take us into our regular business. Item 10, consider a resolution to declare a flooding disaster throughout Minnehaha County in 2019. Jason Gearman. Good morning. Good morning. Jason Gearman, Minneapolis County Emergency Management. And I have uh, Reagan Smith with uh, City of Sioux Falls Emergency Management here also today if there happen to be any questions that are directed directly at the city. Um, so uh, the reason I'm here today is obviously due to the, the weather that we've had over the last couple months. It started in uh, March, March 13th, I believe. And it's continued on through uh, today. Um, they haven't haven't closed specifically closed the date yet. So, in in early March, obviously we had a, a significant rain event, uh, which caused uh, uh, the snow melt uh, and caused significant damage in Sioux Falls with the flooding um, and the ice 
the ice dams, so forth and so on. Uh, that continued uh, throughout the weekend after the 13th and as we went into the transition of looking to looking for recovery after this, we received information from the National Weather Service that uh, was not good. So uh, what they said is we're looking at a near record or above record flooding event due to the snowpack to the north of Sioux Falls and to the upcoming melting uh, with the temperatures. So we transitioned back into uh, emergency operations center and dealt with the issues that uh, were heading through Del Rapids, Baltic, Renner, the Sioux Valley, or the, the, the big Sioux River Basin and Skunk Creek. Uh, Sioux Falls did have a significant amount of activity, uh, sandbagging. Um, Minneapolis County emergency manager in that case uh, is, is in charge of requesting resources for the city of Sioux Falls uh, and obviously the county is needed. Uh, so generally we would probably have a specific date uh, where this would end and at the end of that date uh, we have 30 the state has 30 days to uh, get that information to the federal government uh, for the disaster declaration now beans we haven't really got to an end date yet they've extended this uh, we're expecting it probably end this week sometime unless something else should happen uh, uh, so it's been a continuing event through all this including uh, the ice storm that we had uh, with the power out uh, by Hartford, uh, Sioux Falls uh, the other weekend. So what I'm here today is to declare that disaster, that Minneapolis County is a disaster and we meet the criteria. Um, I believe we are uh, one of many counties. I think there are very few counties in South Dakota that have not or are not, are intending, are not intending to. I think it's only three or four um, so basically the whole state is uh, under a disaster declaration. Any questions? Questions for Jason, Commissioner Benega? I don't really have any questions, but um, you know, this was one of those quote, 100 year significant events or whatever, which seems like we've had three or four in the last 10 years or what, whatever, but I've never, seen a group of people that have come together as a group that made what could have been even a lot worse a better solution than what the city did the county did the townships and all the rural communities that we serve um, we've heard it many many times that you guys have done a great job but I think you need to hear it one more time for sure because um, I don't think you could have done a better job than what you guys did and we certainly appreciate it and I don't think that uh, even if you were affected significantly by a flooding event that you could have asked for any more help than what you guys provided so thank you yeah we were uh, you know I was blessed to have the city there and Reagan and uh, the other people to help me through this uh, beings I was new in this position um, uh, another thing to add is you know as we're still assessing damage uh, right now I'm trying to get information from the townships um, to get their dollar amounts in so we can send that off to the state. Um, if, you know, this is for the public, if you have damage, you can certainly still report it. Um, call 211 and they will uh, go through uh, what they have and what we've given them to, to, to get the amounts and then what they do is directly send them to me and I share them <coughs> with the city of Sioux Falls um, as a lot of the damage to the houses is coming out of the city of Sioux Falls. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, I'm working with the townships, trying to get that information together and hopefully to the state by May 1st. Any other questions, comments? Commissioner Barth? I, I would concur with uh, Commissioner Benega about <coughs> how ev everyone pulled together on this. And certainly that includes uh, the power companies and uh, mm -hmm. the highway people, the, the sheriff's people, police, ambulance, everybody. At the same time, it seems like uh, we can still try to do better as we go forward. And I wonder if we don't need to consider that we may be experiencing some climate change for one reason or another, and maybe need to upgrade our, our uh, building uh, uh, standards, and maybe we should uh, emulate the city where they're purchasing some properties that are uh, in low-lying areas. I know that uh, that there is a program which requires a match 
uh, that we might be able to apply for as well to uh, try to take some of these properties out. I mentioned it to the Del Rapids people the other day, and uh, they didn't think any of those people would move. But, uh, you know, I think uh, why do we need to do sandbagging every year for the same people? I, I think that's a wise move by the city, and I think, uh, 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 Jason, that your suggestion on this is uh, well taken and that Scott's looked into it also with the planning. And I think that uh, in, in some communities, uh, there's been an effort to go door to door to find out more damage and stuff uh, where people maybe th on the elderly tax freeze don't necessarily respond, but they, s they are experiencing huge damage. And uh, we need to do better, but we did great. <laughs> Well, Jason, I just want to thank you again. You know, I know back in March 13th, um, we all hoped that that was a one-time incident, and then here we are, April 24th, and it still has not closed. And I know they thought they were going to close it, and then we had the ice incident. And so, um, and I know I look on my phone, and I see lots of rain in our upcoming forecast, and there's still lots of water around. Um, but we do appreciate what you've done, and, and I know visiting with you, I mean, 211 has been a great resource for folks to be able to call in and make um, and walk you through the, any um, information that you need to make a claim. I've visited with Jason a little bit, and he's been out even personally helping people um, that have needed the help. And so there has been a lot of uh, people going above and beyond. Um, I don't disagree. We can always do a little better. Um, but I think we have really made a lot of resources available, and this is hopefully um, a step towards closing this flood season for 2019. So I appreciate you bringing this forward. And just one thing I'd like to add is, uh, you know, uh, north of us is still having lots of problems. Lake Ponset, that area, the water's still rising, the houses. And, of course, Nebraska and south was is tremendously affected by all this. And, you know, right now the majority of our township roads are in horrible, horrible shape. It's affecting the, the farmers getting back and forth. Uh, dairy farms are affected with the, the big trucks that have to be coming in. So, um, you know, there's, there's maybe not that FEMA loss, but there's that loss for uh, these businesses that are out there uh, in the farm community. Good point. Okay. Madam Chair, I'd make a motion to ask you to sign the uh, declaration of disaster by Minnehaha County due to heavy rain, snow melt, and flooding. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Karski? Aye. Farr? Aye. Benega? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for coming this morning. Okay, that takes us to item 11, which is a public hearing and second reading to consider rezoning <coughs> number 19 01 from um, I 1 Light Industrial District to R 1 Residential District. David Heinhold, good morning. Good morning, County Commission. David Heinold, County Planning Department. Uh, what we have before us is rezoning 19-01. It's to rezone a parcel of land that's located in the unincorporated area of Rowena. Um, that is the address itself is uh, 48272 South Dakota State Highway 42. This is located about um, four miles east of Sioux Falls, and. The, the property request is rezoned from the Owen Light Industrial District to the R1 Residential District. This property encompasses two parcels, which is split up into two uh, 20,000 square foot properties, which is about <coughs> roughly an acre in size. Um, the, the applicant has provided some additional detail from the Planning Commission meeting that w answers some questions that um, neighboring property owners had um, that that have arisen as part of that planning commission. The minutes were provided in your packet as well um, that details some of the things that went on with that. The, the planning commission rec unanimously recommended approval of this rezoning application at the March 25th meeting. Um, and they do have a couple of pictures that do show the site. Um, the area is outlined in red that the applicant wants to rezone to residential. Um, currently it's zoned um, light industrial, but it's right now is being used as a residential house. As you'll see, um, this is the site plan that was provided by the applicant, um, the area outlined in yellow on the map uh, overhead. Um, the, and this is a picture of the house on the site as it exists today. 
um, the so just some of the background as far as adjacent properties to the immediate west of the site is a commercial property and there is mostly s residential property to the south and then ex right to the east of this house is a residential property that is being used as a daycare um, and then to the immediate north you have a light industrial zoned uh, business there and then that's on the other side of which separates there's trees that separate the two properties there as you can see in this picture so if with that I would answer any questions if you have them thank you any questions for David if not at this time is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this item is there anyone who'd like to speak in opposition to this item All right, well then I'm looking for a motion. I make a motion to uphold the Planning Commission's decision to rezone this uh, from A1 Agriculture to C Commercial. Second. <coughs> motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Barth? Aye. Benega? Aye. Karski? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That takes us to item and 12. Madam Chair, I, sp I misspoke on that. I'm sorry. I meant to say to rezone from light industrial to R1 residential. I had gone ahead to item 12 on the list, and uh, I apologize. Second, still the same. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and a second to um, approve the rezoning from 1901 from I1 Light Industrial District to R1 Residential District. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and we'll do another roll call vote. Barth? Aye. Benega? Aye. Karski? Aye. Bender? Aye. Thank you for catching that. My apologies. Yes. All right. So that takes us to item 12, which is a public hearing and second reading to consider rezoning 19-04 from A1 Agricultural District to C Commercial District. Scott Anderson. Yes. Scott Anderson, County Planning Director. Uh, this is a rezoning request uh, to rezone approximately a quarter of an acre of property from the A1 Agriculture District to C Commercial. The property is located between Renner and... Um, uh, Del Rapids on Highway 115, or also 475th. Uh, there, this is an expansion of an existing residential lot, or sorry, expansion of an existing commercial lot that is already on the highway. The applicant is simply asking to uh, rezone um, some land on the back side of the existing commercial property, further enlarging that uh, commercial property and probably better. Uh, allowing it to be utilized in the future. This item has gone before the Planning Commission uh, back in March and it was recommended unanimously for approval. And so uh, I can show you some pictures, but you know, basically there's uh, just a, uh, uh, this empty building or a building that's for sale on the, on the property. And then what the applicant is doing is requesting to enlarge the backside of that. So I'd be glad to answer any questions you have um, about the rezoning request. Any questions for Scott at this time? All right, if not, is there anyone here today who would like to speak in favor of this rezoning? Okay, hearing none, is there anyone here who'd like to, s is opposed to this rezoning? All right, well, it looks like we're ready for a motion then. Madam Chair, I'll overcome my fear of speaking and <laughs> suggest that uh, uh, we approve the commi uh, Planning Commission's decision to rezone, uh, to do the rezoning 19-04 from A1 Agriculture to C Commercial. And I'll second. All right, motion and a second. We've all verified that you've correctly stated the motion, and so we'll take a roll call vote. Benega? Aye. Karski? Aye. Barth? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. <coughs> okay, that takes us to item 13, and we have um, we have pleased to have a presentation on the Sioux Falls Area Humane Society. Corey, good morning. Good morning. 
I'm Corey Beatty, the Executive Director of the Sioux Falls Area Humane Society, and we do have a lengthy presentation, so we're just going to kind of skip through on the most important parts of this, um, just due to time. Um, a lot of you know what we do already, so um, we just wanted to kind of come and tell you a few of our new things that we would like to have people know. Um, basically, the Sioux Falls Area Humane Society's 100th year anniversary is coming up this year. Um, we will be having a celebration in June. Um, 100 years um, that, used to, that we started as the, a mixture of, I think, the Children's Home Society and the Humane Society where animals and children were both orphaned at the same place. So it's kind of neat to find out some of that history there. What we would like to tell you about today, basically, though, is um, one of the biggest things that we are doing um, with our strategic planning is that we are starting to spay and neuter every single animal that goes out the door. Um, it's a huge cost to us. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a risk to us also. We have hired um, a full-time veterinarian. We also had a part-time veterinarian. So every animal that comes in our building now will not leave until it's fixed, which is great because it'll help us with unwanted litters. It'll help with animals running in the counties. Um, in the cities, we do have 21 contracts that we have right now. So that's one of the biggest things that we'd like to report today is that this is a very big initiative for us, and we hope that everyone is in support of that and, um, and stands behind us in that also. So um, the problems that we see mostly in our community um, that come in, Andy, our wonderful humane officer here, um, she has two other people that help her, and I'll let her speak also. Um, in the counties, mostly, people have unvaccinated animals. Uh, we have to be able to get out there. Hopefully, within the next two to three months, we're starting a program where we will probably will be going out to the counties um, and the cities that need help and do some vaccination clinics. Um, you know, our, I guess I call our bucket list would be that we would go out and actually do spay neuter in the county um, and have a mobile unit that does that. Um, it's a huge wish, uh, but we hope to get there. So. Um, the other thing that people have, um, they're not really educated on the ordinances, so they might have, you know, 10 animals and they should only have three, or um, they might have, you know, 106 cats and they should probably have none. So um, <laughs> we hope that, that we can give some education out there because that's been a big problem for Andy and her team to go out and pick up a lot of animals and uh, confine them. So um, I'd like to have Andy report on the statistics. This is something that I think is an eye-opener um, and... Uh, then I'll be back to the next part. So with the slide over here. The, the statistics, uh, as you look at the city and county, um, <coughs> a little over 13% were actually altered. Um, and so that leaves uh, over 86% that are unaltered, and that's where we're, that's our, our biggest problem because we keep getting more and more and more animals astray. And if you look at the returns, 32% of, of the animals are returned. So I think our big focus this year, thank God, <laughs> um, is spay-neuter. Nothing leaves the building unless it's fixed. And then, then, of course, education with people and finding a way to, to help the people because um, I think I learned from the flooding how important animals are how much, how, how supportive they are. Um, I was out there a couple times with Jason Gearman, and of all the things that you have to worry about when your, your personal belongings are floating away, you're worried about your dog and your cat. <laughs> and so we addressed that, I think, really well. We talked with the communities prior to, and then we, um, we housed a lot of animals for people during the flooding. And they could come up and visit them, and that was, I think, really uh, comforting for them to know that they were taken care of. So back to the issue of um, spay and neuter. It's, it's important. Um, our, our stray rates will reduce if we, get, if we focus on that spaying and neutering. Because if you don't have uh, the, the male dog out there running around trying to find the female dog, <coughs> you're going to have less, l less problems. And you're also going to have less aggression because uh, we know when uh, the, the dogs are out and about, you know, you run into that problem as well. So looking, just focusing on that primarily, we're going to reduce the amount of strays we have. And then we can focus on other things in our community. Andy, thank you. Just for the public record, could we get your first and last name? Sure. Andy, 
and then A strike. Thank you. Yeah. And as far as everybody knows, um, we're not talking about people who breed animals. Um, the significant amount of breeders that we have that are great, uh, we're not saying that they're, they're bad people because they do breed and they maintain breeds, um, hunting breeds, other breeds that are, are specific to what people want. Um, so we're not talking about that. We're talking about animals that come into the shelter. This is kind of a neat deal that we like to show everybody, which all of you have seen this, but it is um, a really good indication of what happens when animals go out of control with breeding um, and um, unwanted litters. So that's basically the, why that little thing is here. Um, one of the things that we like to show everyone too is um, that we're not out to make money on all of what we do. And if you look at what goes into our adoption costs, now what we do uh, for all of the pets, we, all of their vaccinations are done, including rabies. They're fixed before they go out the door. So basically what happens is you're getting an animal that is completely medically um, taken care of for the whole next year or so. Um, so a lot of the costs that go into that, you know, are really something that I think people should be aware of because, you know, you might come in and get an animal for $70. Well, if you look at our costs of what it costs to do that, it really kind of shows. So. Um, it takes a lot of money to do what we do, and we do a lot of fundraising to do that. Um, we also, like I said, have some contract income that we use, but we think it's important to make sure that these animals go out and are done so that we don't have to go find them later. Um, basically, we also do the neglect and the cruelty cases, which is um, kind of something that we do. One of the things I think it's important to note, too, is we started a program called Big Paws Canine, and what we do is we take animals up to the penitentiary uh, for our what we call Pearl Pups program, uh, which is Andy's baby. Um, and um, basically we take them up there, they get trained by inmates, um, and um, Andy's done a wonderful job in getting these animals. We have 11 or 12 up there now, um, hoping to get some better kennels up there. Uh, we're gonna work with the prison to do so, but the inmates get a valuable resource and a, a job to do. Um, and I'll just let you tell them a little bit about Big Paws Andy. So. Uh, Big Paws, Big Paws Canine Foundation is located in Sioux Falls, and um, their director out there uh, comes to the prison a couple times a week and helps uh, train the inmates to train the dogs. And the unique thing about this is um, the paroled pups. When you when <coughs> a dog goes to paroled pups, it's because it's rather unruly, <laughs> and we found out. Um, that the dogs that have these little issues of being kind of on the wild side turn out to be some of our best uh, service dogs. Uh, there's three examples. Um, the little gal on the right had been into uh, three homes before she finally now is a service dog. And it just takes that consistency and training that um, the inmates have to get the dog where it needs to be. So it's finding a home for even the wild ones. And it's great, it's very rewarding for the dog handlers, for our, our humane society, and also uh, for the dogs themselves. The other thing that we wanted to tell you about is another uh, partnership that we've made with the National Search and Rescue Foundation. We have currently 16 dogs that have been trained for national search and rescue. So they're going to different disasters around the country. Um, we just got another one out two weeks ago that will be in um, his national training in California, hopefully starting next week. Um, they're trained for not only disaster, but cadaver. They're trained for drugs, um, alcohol, and bombs. And so it's really cool to see a shelter animal from Sioux Falls, South Dakota get to that point. So it's really a, a, a neat thing that I don't think a lot of people know that we do. And basically, what we really want to be at the end of the day is to be proactive about what we're doing. Um, there's a lot that people don't understand about a humane society in general. Um, we are a no-kill shelter. There's always definitions that are here, there, and otherwise about that. But basically what that means is we will take in any animal of any breed and help them until they find their forever home. Um, unless they are aggressive, um, we have to watch for the public. We do make sure that we watch that very carefully. They have behavior tests that that we do that are very stringent. Um, we will not adopt out animals that are aggressive to people um, or children. Um, we also have to watch our feral cat population, which is, is really huge in the county. Uh, people have a lot of wild cats that they feed. 
Um, we have to be careful. They're, a, they're kind of a medical risk. So that's kind of one of the things that we're seeing you know, go on. Um, we also have um, a larger um, drug problem, which is also causing us some problems animal-wise. Um, you know, with, with the arrests and things going up for drugs, um, we also see a lot of animals come in that get confiscated at the same time. So I have to watch medical issues with them, make sure that they're not tainted, um, basically from the drugs that were made in a home or whatever it might be. So it's kind of one of those things that it's evolving uh, throughout the years, and it gets different every year. Um, we do not also breed ban. Um, we have no breed banning. There is none allowed in our state. So we're going to be working with some property owners that specifically try to breed ban here in Sioux Falls. Um, we do call landlords before we adopt to people, so we make sure the landlords are okay with what they're getting. So we're trying to be as responsible, I think, as we can, and um, we do appreciate the partnership we have with all of uh, the counties and the cities. And um, so if there's any questions for us, um, that's really what we need to tell you. Any questions this morning? Commissioner Karski. Just curious, that last part caught my, caught my attention. So if I own a large apartment complex that allows dogs, I can say I can will allow all dogs except Great Danes or whatever breed I don't want. That's illegal for me as a property owner to do that? Um, basically, the state, um, there's a state law that has, that there is no breed banning in any of the cities. And this was passed, what, three years ago, I think? Mm -hmm. So um, we will, uh, uh, service dogs always have to be allowed no matter what breed they are, obviously, because um, that's just ADA requirement. Um, but there also is some sketchy lines um, with that, with property owners, whether or not they can do that or not. And we're going to be working to find out what that is. Hmm. We need to find out kind of where that's at. Yes, people do own properties. Uh, people do own apartments. But can they just say, no, we don't want German Shepherds and Great Danes and Chihuahuas? Um, they can, but they should not be. And so that's kind of where we're looking into mm -hmm. seeing what those lines are going to be. Um, to be honest, I mean, we have probably more dog bites from little tiny dogs than we do the big ones. I know we do at the Humane Society. We've never had, there's been several um, different bites, but a lot of them are from smaller dogs, which is really kind of a surprise. So, But we will be working towards getting an understanding, I guess, maybe of that. Okay. So, I, I think it's more, too, that they're referring to certain breeds, not necessarily, you know, it isn't like they're saying 50 pounds or over or, right. you know, 50 pounds or under. They're, they're, when they're, their language is particular breeds. And, and I think part of that, too, unless they do a DNA test on an animal, they don't know what breed it really is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a lot of the apartment complexes are making people get DNA before they, you know, they'll do a swab before they even move in, which is really responsible of them because then they can keep their areas clean obviously and then um, also to find out kind of what you know what the history of the animal might be too so mm -hmm. Any other questions? Commissioner Barth. You know the DNA part is of interest to me because I know the city was doing DNA testing on some watersheds like over on Skunk Creek and uh, so they would be able to determine if it was dog, cat, rabbit, human, whatever <laughs> and uh, you know, in an uh, apartment complex situation, you might know who the violators were about leaving debris around uh, on the grass. And is, uh, are people doing that? They are. Um, there's a lot of apartment complexes now that make every single, if they, you know, they have to pay deposits, obviously, for pets. And when they pay their deposit, they actually give them the test. Um, it's basically just, just a swab like we would do with a human. Um, they send it in and, and get the DNA back, and they can actually match that, yes. So kind of amazing how they mm. sort of with our microchips too that's another one when we microchip animals they they're all microchipped when we go out too so when they mm. if they get lost we can just scan them now and most often all vets pretty much everywhere have have the scanners too so it just helps them to get back to where they need to be so then we know who owns them we hope <laughs> anyways anything else well thank you both for yeah. coming this oh. morning it's very informative we really appreciate the work you guys do thank you very much Okay, so that takes us to item 14. We consider a motion to authorize the state's attorney's office to enter into a contract with Thompson Reuter for Westlaw Legal Research. Drew, good morning, welcome. Good morning, uh, good to see you again in short notice. Uh, long story short, when we entered the contract, it was two weeks ago, uh, we weren't given access to something that we were supposed to give access to, so this con new contract uh, 
uh, corrects that error. Also, uh, they threw in additional access, and the price point for the life of the contract is actually less over the three-year term uh, because the one-year or the increase yearly is a 1% increase instead of a 3%. So the state's attorney's office is seeking authorization to sign that contract. And also, uh, Commissioner Barth, just uh, from what you noted two weeks ago, we are starting some discussions about putting everything on one billing uh, okay. because the firewall that uh, wasn't in place a couple years ago is now in place, and, and they think that is an option that we could maybe get all legal services onto one contract. So. Any questions for Drew? If not, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. So we have a motion and a second to approve the, um, the request. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mm. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Next item is to authorize the chairperson to sign the stockpile land lease agreement with the South Dakota Department of Transportation. Craig Dewey, good morning. Good morning, Craig Dewey, Commission Office. This contract is a lease with the South Dakota Department of Transportation uh, for six acres of land uh, near exit 402 on Interstate 90. Uh, the Minnehaha County Highway Department has uh, negotiated an agreement with the State uh, Department of Transportation to use this land uh, for uh, storing uh, asphalt uh, and gravel or other aggregate while the state continues to work on a certain road project. Uh, in speaking with uh, Travis Dressen, who is an engineer with the South Dakota Department of Transportation, he indicated that that project should wrap up at the end of 2020. Uh, so this contract has also been sent to uh, DJ at the Highway Department as well as Travis with the South Dakota Department of Transportation. I would be happy to stand by and answer any questions. Are there any questions for Craig this morning? Uh, I have a one here. So do we need to authorize the chair to sign this lease or how do we go forward? Correct, yes. Uh, the request or motion <coughs> would be for the authorizing the chair to sign this lease. Make that motion. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item is liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports this morning? Surprise. Commissioner Barth. Um, we had a Dean uh, and I had a meeting yesterday with the Multicultural Intergovernmental Board, and uh, it was a very favorable meeting, I would say. Uh, one aspect is uh, Christy over there is planning to apply for grant money to help uh, with some of the infrastructure, which of course is county property, and she's uh, working with uh, Mark Krenz on that, and uh, I didn't think we would have any objection to her applying for a grant money from the Deadwood Foundation. Correct. Uh, um, and other than that, I would say that they have a huge number of events and they'd love to have us all participate and come. Yeah, I'll just put in a plug for them too. They have an event facility that's open for public rental. So if somebody's planning a large family reunion, a wedding, the roller dolls use it, et cetera, et cetera. Just, um, they're trying to get the word out. So I'll just put a plug in for them that, hey, uh, if you need, a, you need an event or a venue, um, think about the Multicultural Center. I just would add that I know Christy, Christy's on the Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce and she's done a really good job of being plugged in and helping the chamber go out and um, increase their diversity of their membership and, and in fact tomorrow we are having Ethiopian food from a new Ethiopian restaurant that Christy facilitated that relationship. So I, I know they do very important work so I appreciate, I appreciate you guys attending that meeting and the work they do. Commissioner Barth. So another one, if I may, we had a meeting last night of the Planning Commission. Uh, we got out of here at 10, 10 o'clock or so. But we, um, it was a joint meeting of the city and county, uh, and we had a, uh, a <coughs> Board of Adjustment meeting and a, uh, just a county meeting, so three meetings sitting in the same chair. Um, we, uh, we declined to do a, an adjustment out at the uh, Yogi Bear campground where they wanted to build a building too close to uh, the, um, the exit ramp. Uh, we deferred a couple other things, but uh, it was a full room again. We were, uh, I, don't, I don't know, there were 68 people or so I counted. Mm. Well, thank you. 
Thank you to all the folks on that that sit on that committee. You guys have been putting in well, long hours. One more hours. comment on that. Yes. Uh, we also looked at some potential revisions to our county ordinances on signage. Uh, there's been some court decisions that uh, have uh, made restrictions on signs a little bit more more difficult. But uh, uh, and there are a lot of signs we don't even think about uh, that are out there that. <laughs> would fall under these regulations and uh, anyway that will come to the Commission in the future okay thank you any other liaison reports okay item 17 new business any new business any old business if not I'd entertain a motion to recess our meeting that's my motion second motion a second all in favor aye, aye. any opposed motion passes unanimously Thank you very much. Um, we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes, about 10.15. <coughs> Thank you.